What's up, guys, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the New Vintage Podcast. I am Jabro, and I'm with Steve. Hope everyone's doing well out there. And for you guys who have never seen the show before, we're two guys that like talking over the biggest stories in gaming. And today, we love always love to start with what we've been playing. So, Steve, what we've been playing? So yeah, so uh, to no surprise, I've been playing Resident Evil Village. Nice. Nah, gotta talk about this. Yeah. Whole a whole lot of it. So uh, I have completed it. I did do a full run through. Took me quicker than i thought it would do i uh, I think once i beat it i was just under eight hours Mm. um played it on the normal setting i didn't i know people were saying to go right into the hard mode and stuff i wanted to enjoy the gameplay story and the atmospheres first and uh yeah i have a lot of good things to say about it there's there's some bad too it's not a perfect game Uh, you know what game is um but the game really struck the chords that i wanted to you know it, it got that sort of castlevania vibe with the aesthetic and the you know the culture the way it's all built uh, around there pulled you know the right amount i think of references and inspiration from resident evil 4 uh from the themes you know the thematically i think they really nailed it out of the park i think it's awesome just to be in europe in general i think it's the first resident evil that goes there i know we went to africa in five six i don't remember where it even took place you know but so it's cool that they're really expanding it um I think there was a couple of cop-outs and a couple of sort of, hey, we need to do this because it has to be connected to Resident Evil somehow. And it's just a variety package, you know. It's it's interesting. This is obviously, it's a true and true sequel to 7. It's supposed to be, obviously we know that. It's the same main character. A lot of references and you see some flashbacks to events that happened in Resident Evil 7. So it's really cool on where it went from. Um, I think gameplay does obviously enhance some things. A little bit more here it's obviously a little bit more of a shooter uh, which it makes sense in a in a way they, they kind of quickly throw uh right at the beginning they're like oh yeah you did some training with chris over the three years there's a three-year gap between the two resident evil games and that's supposed to just be kind of the throwaway line why you're so much better at shooting and and the melees and all that stuff because you had some combat training with chris um so it's kind of like quick patching at the beginning just to kind of get you where you need to be and then it gets where the game starts. I think the cast of characters are all really well done. Obviously, the world is infatuated with Lady D. Um, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Demescu, whatever it is. Um, she's Lady D. That's why I always call her. So, um, so she she's you know everyone's infatuated with her. I think there's some other characters that the shopkeep, the Duke. I think is a super underrated character. I'm glad now he's sort of popping up over this weekend on Twitter. People have been he was trending for a while. Um, I think he's really well done yeah, he's awesome. um, from the from the voice acting to just him being this pudgy guy in the cart. You know, so, you know, it's obviously a, a story that you're trying to go get your daughter back and the twists and turns and some of the story elements don't really make sense in my opinion. Um, not that I'm not going to give away the full ending here, but it, it's just weirdly patched together where it's just trying to get you to the next part. I do like the sort of commander type deal where it's like, well, here are the four commanders, which is the four kids of mother miranda and go take them on i think each chapter has a nice vibe a nice twist to it you know there's the water section there's obviously the castle section with the lady d and the vampires and her daughters um so there's really just the one chapter which i really did not enjoy and that's later on which is in heisenberg he's the guy who controls the lichens you go to his factory and the game just really falls apart there for me i i don't know really what other people are feeling that whole section i think was really done just out of vibe to me uh it's just become it became a shooting gallery it became uh you're running out of ammo finally and having to deal with these weird bosses who just you have to keep making guys run into the wall to shoot them in the back and just felt like it was there to sort of elongate the game a little bit and then obviously you finally get to heisenberg's boss battle which i did not not that i didn't enjoy but it was just again it just the pacing was off where the rest of the game had, you know, a nice sort of under-horror feel. It was not, like, a super scary game. But then you got to the Heisenberg area, and I was, like, I didn't feel like playing the game. And I kind of had to force myself just to get through that section, that one chapter. Which is really the only downfall for me in the whole game is that one chapter. Which, I guess, you know, the game's roughly broken up into, like, six chapters. Uh, not officially, but I think that little segment with Heisenberg is the one I don't enjoy that much. Besides that, I mean, the game leaves off potentially to some dlc or resident evil 9 i don't know where they're going to go with this or how they're going to go with it 
but I think the game is exactly what I wanted at this moment. I wanted a solid just not this 50 hour game where I need to go collect a bunch of things and the game has all the Resident Evil tropes that obviously all the things from 7 were evolved into this one. So all in all, I mean, I absolutely love the game. I'm actually, I haven't replayed it. I'm playing the little bonus mode you unlock when you beat it. The mercenaries mode and stuff like that. I don't know if I'm going to jump into a second playthrough just yet. Because I, you know, I can't platinum Resident Evil games just because it's always those crazy, you have to beat it three times and then you can beat it, you know, beat the game in under two hours, three hours. I don't, I can't do that. I don't have the patience to do that. So I don't know if I'm going to jump in exactly yet to a second playthrough. I might wait a little bit. But currently it's still installed on my system, playing these other little bonus modes. And there's some parts I could like to revisit and stuff. Because I do like the beginning of the game really, really strong in my opinion. So those are my quick thoughts on uh, Resident Evil Village. Yeah, I did have a question for you. Because I've, I, I've seen a lot of chatter online about this. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so curious about. So the timeline, it has more uh, of a shorter span of time that it takes to beat this game compared to maybe some other games that you did the time bother you at all do, is it a feature that you like that's you know under 10 hours how do you how do you feel about that as it being a full priced game so yeah it was um caught me off guard because a lot of people were estimating oh the games yeah right before launch and the early reviews were like oh it's 10 hours i'm like uh, i don't know how long it took me to beat resident evil 7 um, the only thing I can compare, you know, Resident Evil 3 is what I played last year, and that game took me like five hours or something like that. So it's strange. I think it hit that sweet spot because besides that one section that I keep mentioning, um, the, everything that's in the game is done really well. So it's not like it wasn't bloated. Or there was a lot of scenes where I thought the game could have really bloated itself for no reason. I think it's actually a good spot uh, thinking about all these other games that are just so dense sometimes. Um, it's kind of the same, you know, thing where for Miles, uh, Spider-Man Miles, where I was like, I beat it, and I was like, nice. I, I, you know, it wasn't a 30, 40, 50 hour game, you know. It could have been a little bit longer, I guess so. It, it always could have been, but I would rather have a shorter game and a, you know, better tight nip game than a longer game that just I'm not going to be or eventually gets, I put it on the shelf and don't get back to it, so... I'm, I'm in a mixed bag, but I, I was okay with it. I was happy with it. Yeah, I would say there's something to be said for like not overstaying your welcome and kind of just telling the story you want to tell and then getting out. So I can appreciate that. And uh, yeah, you raised some, some great points about this one. And again, for anybody who doesn't know, like these are games I watch, uh, Resident yeah. Evil. So I, I watch this one uh, front to back. And uh, I really liked what I saw. I was really impressed with, with, with it. Uh, I was really hoping that this was a really good game not only because you know i know people love resident evil but because i feel like there, we're in a little bit of a resurgence and i just this is a proper brand new mainline resident evil game and i was like i hope that they don't burn out all the goodwill that was instilled by specifically to remake i feel like really brought a lot of goodwill to the franchise again that had kind of uh tapered a little bit it didn't evaporate it always has its fans but certainly it being you know thrust back into the cultural uh, mainstream is something like a newer phenomenon so I'm glad that they're able to maintain a lot of that momentum uh, it's, it's a very smart game again uh, it took a lot of s the setting or the vibe that you would have saw in 4 it took the gameplay of 7 mm -hmm. and it kind of just mo merged that together and introduced some again you said like Castlevania themes that, that all that Eastern European dark vibes that oh. uh, I think is just so awesome and uh, they did a really really good job with it personally and uh it's not a game that I'm going to sit there and run through a million times. I watched videos of people completely breaking that game. They're so good at it. It's awesome. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm really impressed with what they were able to put together. And it makes me really excited and interested to see what they do uh, going forward with the franchise and what gameplay style that they keep. Are they going to keep on with the remakes? Are we getting a 4 remake? And I wonder how that looks. How does a 4 remake look uh, mm -hmm. now with Village being out? Um, and, and again, they're very different games. I don't mean to like put them on the same level that they're the exact same thing, but I just wonder how that looks in comparison, especially um, just having a straight PS5 port is unnecessary because obviously the, you got a PS4 port of Resident Evil 4 that's completely playable exactly. on PS5. So if they brought it back, it would be a, probably a top to bottom remake and a 4 remake obviously would draw a lot of comparisons to Village. So I just wonder what they're going to do going forward from here. And uh, 
For me, personally, I would say that this game suffers from, I think, the same thing 7 suffers from. And uh, I won't go too deep into this because, you know, there's spoiler territory and people... Not, it, it's fairly early, not everybody's beat the game. Mm-hmm. But I would say that their incessant need, as you mentioned, to connect it so hard makes it get really unbalanced on the latter half of the game like they did in 7 as well. Um and uh, I spent a lot of time watching this, and it's like always like it has this very unique um, story. Same thing with Seven, this one, where you're like, oh, this is something where I've never seen the franchise go in this direction. I don't know how this is connected, but I think there's a beauty in this being like, this is in that universe. The connections are loose, but that's okay. Like this is a this is the village story, or uh, this is you know Seven Biohazard. This is their own thing in Louisiana. This is their own thing in this strange village. Um, but when they all try to kind of neatly fit it into this Resident Evil universe where it's like, actually, even though it seems like there's this, all this going on, this is actually what's going on and this is how it connects. It feels very Scooby-Doo to me where, yeah. where you get this whole episode where it's like, oh my God, there's ghosts and goblins and all this stuff. And it's like, oh no, it's just a man in a mask and it's up. Oh, you thought it was this crazy thing, but nothing, nothing supernatural here. It's like. That's what I I hate, and with this one, this is the one I feel like does it the most. Where it's like, holy crap, I don't know how they're connected, and when they do, it's like, oh, okay, I I see, and it's not that it's poorly written, but it's like I just feel like you don't necessarily need to explain away every single facet of the science of what's going on here and why it looks like a ooky spooky ghost, but it's not. This is <laughs> it's just yeah. another virus, and I'm like, what the or the fungus and it's like what, the limitations of this virus fungus phenomenon is just comical to me at this point it's because i'm like i'm sure at some point they're gonna in the next one they're gonna have a dude who's straight is like phasing through walls and it's like oh not just a, just a mushroom man just that, that's what it did to him and it's it, it's a little comical but uh other than that I, I do think that they did a phenomenal job with this game and i'm really glad that people are liking it uh had, had you played anything else or have you put a bulk of your time into resident evil so most of my most of this past week went to Resident Evil again. I, you know, I was not rushing it. I was not rushing. I was taking my time. There's tons of times where I just stopped to look at the game because I'm playing it on PlayStation Five. The game is gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. How, there's no loading. I don't know how they did it, but there's literally no loading. Like you can go through from village all the way through Lady D's castle, and there's no loading. So that's where a bulk of my time is went. Obviously, because I needed to dive in. Um, but as we know, Friday. Mass Effect Day. It yes. was Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Now we're talking. So I, I did get Mass Effect Legendary Edition. I'm obviously only in Mass Effect One. I'm like seven hours in. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, so uh, I I put more work into it than I thought. Um, it helps that I got it on my Series X. Uh, I also have my One X in the bedroom, so all the save carryovers immediately, so I don't have to do anything. So I can, you know, I was still up uh, one night, and I guess went for it. <laughs> it went like two nights. Um, from my Xbox One X in the bedroom. Um, and I don't know what to say that has not been said. The game, is obviously, it's just, it's weird going back <laughs> to, to, to the game that we know so well uh, for the most part. And, you know, Mass Effect 1 is the one we have. I have not played repeatedly so often. Usually when people talk about their, you know, replays, they jump into 2 or whatever it is. Um, and it's great to be back in this world. The world's never looked better. It's so interesting to see some of these characters and how these some of these scenes go down, obviously, with the new system. You know, some of the buttons and stuff has been fixed. Uh, I'm still not a big fan of the... I always call it Dune Buggy. What is it? The Mako or whatever? The Mako, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've never been a fan of those. They tweak the controls that make it better. Still not a fan, <laughs> still not a fan of those. Um, you know, the game does show its age, but... Everything about Mass Effect 1, obviously the remake, or enhanced, I'm not even sure what they call it, um, is just getting me so excited to really go through this trilogy again. I can't wait to get into Mass Effect 2 and 3. And But I'm also enjoying my time with Mass Effect 1. I'm not rushing it, like I'm saying. I'm kind of going in like I'm completely new new vision. I, there's you know, so many things I forgot of what to do. It's not like I, I'm not one of those people who know exactly what to do for every mission. So I'm exploring a little bit, talking to people, going back and forth uh, to find out where am I supposed to go, which, you know, opens up the lore and stuff like that. So I'm like right in that intro phase of 
Mass Effect, and that's uh, those are the two things. Obviously, all I've been playing. Resident Evil went right into Mass Effect, and it's been pretty much just Mass Effect uh, all weekend. Awesome, yeah. Um, and I guess I'll just piggyback off of what you described. Yeah, I'm also mm-hmm. playing Mass Effect. Jumped in on Friday. Really, really impressed. Really loving what uh, what they put together there. And the funny thing is, I actually have played the trilogy very recently. I think as recent as the show was happening when I was uh, playing through these I games. So. I'm pretty sure. And so the trilogy is actually very fresh into my mind. So I kind of have that direct comparison of what they fixed and what they didn't. Because I, I played these games. I played one in its just original form on PS3. So, um, yeah, no, they, they cleaned it up quite a bit. Uh, I love the fixes that they made to the UI, the leveling system, the fact that your weapons are not super tied to your class anymore, and now you can kind of play around with things as needed. So I just love that. You know, I'm a soldier, and I'm like pulling, swapping from weapon to weapon to weapon, and it just makes uh, battles a lot more dynamic in a way that I feel like you were really hampered and kind of like set into a linear path, especially Mm -hmm. with one uh, in the original one. So they tweaked a lot of that. I agree with you. I don't like the Mako controls still. And that was like maybe the one disappointment for me is I on their list of things that they tweaked for one, that was a big one. I feel like they really uh, were flexing about like, you know, oh, we fixed the Mako controls. And that was one of the major annoyances I had the first time. And though I feel like it feels a lot better uh, than the original one, it still doesn't feel the way I want to. I want it to just control like a car, but it still is reliant, I feel like, on this joystick weird, like one is moving forward, the other one's directing the reticle, then it moves forward from there. And I, I just don't like it to drive like that. I would much prefer kind of like an R2 X jump thing where you can control it, just like a regular car, like if you were like yeah. playing GTA or whatever. Um and that's just not what they chose to do. Fair enough. Um, but other than that, everything else is really, really solid. I'm just past the part where you get Liara, so I'm a little bit above four hours in. So, and I'm and I do fully intend on working through the three games. I'm gonna go from you know one to two to three. And this time, I'm really gonna try to dive into all, as much of the DLC content as possible because I really just wanted to get through the story the first time. Uh, and then with three, I feel like I did a little bit more side content to ensure that I got galactic readiness. But mm-hmm. now for this time, now that it's all in a clean, neat package, uh, I'm going to try to play through everything before I move on to two. And then the same thing with two before I move on to three. So, yeah, double thumbs up from me, especially if you are in the PlayStation ecosystem. Get this game if you're interested in Mass Effect. Uh, if you're in the Xbox ecosystem, this is actually an interesting question I have for you. So if somebody has the trilogy... Uh, on Mm -hmm. Xbox 360, but it's backwards compatible, so they can play it on even their Series X if they want to, especially if they have it on disc, they just pop it in there. Uh, And it it cleans it up a little bit just by virtue of playing it on this um, software, or this new hardware. However, the load times are not going to be as good, obviously. It's not going to be as pretty. You're not going to be running anything at 120 frames per second. Would you still suggest they get this $60 package? Because I think there's enough tweaks to justify it. I do, I do. Obviously, if if it's someone who's played Mass Effect tons of times and they're not interested, I guess, in playing Mass Effect One, it, it's a rough one. Um, especially, it's rough because uh, most people who have Xboxes, you know, have Game Pass, which now has EA Play, which has all three Mass Effects and Andromeda on there. So essentially, for whatever fifteen, ten bucks a month, you could get this this trilogy. Um, and obviously, we don't know really the difference between two and three. I think. The I think all the updates and stuff justify. I think it's brought the game way more playable. I had Mass Effect One still installed on my PC, um, so I had to. I, the nerd in me I was like, I have to go see Mass Effect One, and wow, it's uh, rough. You know, it was the controls were a little bit wonky, and it's like those small things that even things that they may not have mentioned on just how the shooting's a little bit you know smoother and stuff like that. I think so. I I think if you're looking for a good place to put your money this is definitely a, a good investment obviously you said for playstation it's really the only way to play mass effect on the new systems there's no other way i don't know if they're on now or and stuff like that but you know the the three games are stuck on ps3 again on xbox it's a little bit different you know if you're tight on cash and stuff you know obviously you have to go go in there just you know the way the saves work you won't be i don't understand i don't believe you can go from you know, you're saved from Mass Effect 1 native to the Legendary Edition to Mass Effect oh, 2. I doubt it, yeah. I, I, I highly doubt it. Um, so I do think it's, you know, it, it, it 
you got to think of the amount of content you're getting in one package. Because uh, I did see some people complaining where it's like, oh, how come they're not selling them a la carte and stuff like that? I'm like, well, no, once you see the package and the way the saves work and the fact that um, I got it digitally. Um, so, well, I know you did too, obviously, because you have PlayStation 5 digital. Yeah. Um, you know, I like that they didn't ins- make me install all three games off the rip. You know, you I was wow. I'm like, this is a small install. And when I launched it, and they're like, all right, do you want to install two and three? I'm like, no, there's no reason for me to install two and three now. So I think just that overall package, the cleanliness of having one little block, and that's going to be your extended journey through this, you know, this saga. I think it, it, it's okay, and I think it is way more justified to to be able to purchase it. Yeah, I think, and then I agree completely with your thoughts, and pretty much uh, there is something to be said for just a dedicated port to modern consoles. Uh, and the funny thing is I actually have one regret related to the purchase of this collection, and whenever I, so we have both have the privilege of having access to both next-gen machines, and yeah. so we can kind of choose where to play games depending, and usually what affects me is, is there a noticeable difference in where it plays, and what am I playing on the other console? So, like, if I have a whole bunch of stuff to play on PS5, chances are I'm probably going to try to buy something on Series X. So I get usage out of both machines. That's kind of usually what I do. Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, before I buy a game, I always try to do the research. Like, is there any performance differences? But I just, in my excitement, I just went ahead and just bought Mass Effect. And I didn't do mm-hmm. the research because time after time after time, I would re- research these games. And the differences would be minute, if anything, on the differences between the performances between the hardware. So I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to even check it. Whatever. And I just bought it on PS5. I bought Resident Evil uh, Village and um, Mass Effect pretty much on the same night. And like two weeks ago or something like that. And no big deal. And then comes out the story that they're talking about that there is noticeable performance differences between the Xbox and the PS5 version. The Xbox can maintain that 120 uh, hertz. And I'm like, oh. I that For the first time, I don't look up the performance differences. And there's yeah. actually a massive performance difference between the thing. Which is, uh, at least it's just, I mean, it's a frame rate thing. It's fine. Like, I'm not tripping off that. It's not like I'm trying to play like Titanfall or something like that. That I could actually, yeah, or Destiny, twitchy. that I could really want that. Um, mm-hmm. 120 frames, so that's okay. But that that did annoy me. I was like, otherwise, I 100% would have got it on my Series X because I have plenty to play on my PS5 already. Uh, but I wasn't thinking. So that's like the one regret I have. And yeah, so double thumbs up for me for Mass Effect. And another thing I was playing is I got Mario 3D World with the Bowser Fury, I think it's called, or something yep, like yep. that. Bowser, yep. And uh, on Switch, obviously. Really, really enjoying that game. Uh, I was looking for something new to play, and there's a game that I have already, but I... Well, I have the version, obviously, without Bowser's Fury, but I have it on Wii U, and I just hate playing Wii U. So I I bought it, and I then shortly after, the Switch came out, so I just never went back to it. And then we would dabble on it. Like, I'd play it with you every once in a while, but it, it was not mm-hmm. a front-to-back run that we did or anything like that. So I, I've dabbled with this game, but this is my first time kind of sitting down with it. And I'm actually having a lot of fun with it. I think it's really, really well-designed. It's a, it's a pretty game. It looks good on Switch. It looks pretty much from what I remember it, exactly how it looked on Wii U. Uh, but, yeah, it performs really, really well. I love the little cat upgrade. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like it's super OP yeah. when I'm just kind of mm-hmm. just climbing up the walls and slash. It, it, you could take care of these boss fights really easy just by, like, pretty much endlessly spamming the slash because it very seldomly can they really do anything about it. Um, so, yeah, I do feel like it's a little OP. But other than that, I think it's really, really solid. I was really impressed by the Bowser's Fury part of the game. And did you did you buy this collection? I did, yep. Just because I, I was a fan of the original game, so I did. Uh, I beat 3D World, and I've played Bowser's Fury once, just to look at the mechanics. I haven't really, like, completed it yet. Okay, yeah. So I, from what I can tell the content is of Bowser's Fury, I'm maybe, like, halfway through it. And I was actually really impressed with what they were put together. And almost immediately... Um, I was playing it, and Alyssa was next to me, and she was, she drew the comparison that it kind of gave her Ganon vibes of him freaking out in Breath of the Wild. It, it gave me a lot of those vibes, too, mm-hmm. where uh, the kind of your environment shapes around you depending on the kind of day-night cycle that's tied to his, I guess, emotional state in that moment. Uh, r- really interesting mechanic. Um, I feel like this is an interesting idea that they're dabbling with here. It doesn't feel fully realized to me. Uh, I feel like this is something that may be utilized in a future game. Kind of how like this game dabbles with uh, the Toad. I forget what's his name. Um, 
Oh, the Captain Toad? Yeah, the Captain Toad stuff, and then he got his own dedicated game that fully realizes that concept. I feel like that's the same thing with Bowser's Fury here, where they're like dabbling with it and showing something and testing it and seeing people's feedback. And so this is a mechanic that will probably be used in a future Mario game in some capacity, and not in a very literal way, but in a way that this kind of like morphing and open environment that you can kind of move around with and do these little mini stages with, and there's this giant uh, variable in the middle that kind of impacts that. Uh, and so it's a new mechanic for Mario. I think it's pretty dope. Um, but yeah, it, it seems a little bit underutilized. Like I feel like they, they're 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 not fleshing it out all the way yet. But generally, I'm pretty positive on the game overall. Uh, I'm only on World Three, so a vast majority of the game I still feel like I have yet to see. But I'm I'm getting my little green stars together and moving my way along. Mm-hmm. I try to do a couple stages a night uh, and just kind of slowly move my way through this the story because I'm not trying to like bang through this game. I'm, it's kind of my decompression, like when I'm like, okay, so I have a bang. I've done multiple hours of Mass Effect. It's a little heavy. My head hurts. Let me just play a little Mario to kind of decompress. That's yeah. usually my <laughs> my game thing. It's not something the first thing I jump into the morning, but it's some, it's kind of like what I like to taper off playing. So, yeah, those are, like, the main two things I've spent uh, a bulk of my time playing. And then, obviously, yeah, because I'm nut, I'm a nutcase, I still jump into GTA V <laughs> at least <laughs> once a week. Um, still, I still jump into GTA V, like, once a week or so. Just to right. I buy a business, see how my businesses are doing, you know, play a little bit, sell some stuff, make a little bit of money, buy some cars, you know, screwing around. The same thing I've done for the past, what, eight years that i've been playing it or something like that something, i get yeah because yeah, it came out in 2013 2013 this is your third place in system you're on yeah, playing it's, it's not good like i feel smooth brained <laughs> when i play this like i'm like what am i doing look at the shape yeah. of me but yeah no other than that yeah that's pretty much everything i've been playing so uh i guess we could probably move into stories if you want yeah absolutely so our first story is about this playstation discord thing so we've been lightly covering this for the past few weeks and we heard that there was kind of negotiations with microsoft and that that kind of fell through and so now we have another update and these stories are not necessarily connected a lot of people like to connect it like oh this is why it it fell apart not necessarily but um playstation has announced that it has made a minority investment into Discord as a way to build a relationship between the popular online chat service and Sony. Jim Ryan, president and CEO of PlayStation, announced the partnership in a short blog post. Uh, Though aside from disclosing its minority stake, not a lot of other details were shared. Sony says it has taken a minority stake in Discord's Series H round and that PlayStation has spoken with Discord co-founders Jason Citron and Stan Vishnevsky on ways to bring friends and communities together. Empowering players to create communities and enjoy shared gaming experiences is at the heart of what we do. This is uh, what Jim Ryan is saying. So we're beyond excited to start this journey with one of the world's most popular communication services. So I saw a little bit of misinformation going around related to this story. So first off, Sony has not bought Discord. They, mm-hmm. they do not own Discord. They have a stake, so they are now shareholders in Discord. So there is a some degree of a light partnership there. Uh, it's a minority stake, so they don't have majority ownership. They're not past the 51% shareholder uh, threshold that would take for them to, I guess, control Discord. But with a company as large as Sony or PlayStation... Owning some of your shares, naturally, uh, there's going to be some dialogue that's happening there. And the fact that Jim Ryan and the CEOs of Discord are having, or the founders of Discord are having dialogue, shows that there is work that they're going to do together to come, I'm sure. Uh, But this is a very interesting thing. And because they're minority shareholders in Discord now, that's what tells me that this is not necessarily connected to the Microsoft thing. Because two things can Mm -hmm. be true, and I think Sony can easily become a shareholder in something that Microsoft also has a connection to. It, it, they're not so against each other that I don't think that they'll dip money into something that can make them both money at the same time. I mean, they worked together in small ways before, so that I don't... I mean, even with the, the cloud gaming thing, they both put money into a pot to develop cloud gaming services together. So I don't think that these necessarily things are correlated. My guess is Discord wanted to remain open to be able to accept money and shares or sell shares to these companies like Sony and Microsoft maybe wanted to outright buy them. Maybe that's what was happening. But again, that's speculation on my part. Uh, what were your thoughts about when you heard this story? 
yeah, it was, you know, it was interesting, and I had the same reaction. You know, there were so many different versions and title heads of the story. People clickbait, and you know, Sony purchases Discord. And I'm like, oh, and I click the link. I'm like, no, it looks like they did a, yeah, you know, they bought a couple, you know, stakes into the company, and of course that will probably lead into a, a part, a more developed partnership. But I mean, it's it's just you know, it's it's behind the scenes type deal. You gotta remember, you know, Sony keeps buying smaller, smaller chunks of Epic. And nothing's really, you know, certain, nothing's really exploded from that and stuff like that. But obviously I think it's good. Uh, you know, the jumping past the stakeholders and I don't have stocks in Sony or anything like that. I think it's cool. I think, I think I even mentioned this when we were talking about the Xbox trying, or when, when that discussion came up, I was like, well, they're probably trying to bring in that community, uh, especially that Xbox is so cross PC now. Um, Sony slowly dipping their... I guess pinky toe into that <laughs> pool with releasing very small, you know, random titles and stuff like that. Yeah. This will obviously help. You know, if you have people on PC talking to people on PlayStation, I think eventually there will be a multiplayer game that will help unite. It'll probably launch maybe. I don't know how Discord app works on PlayStation. I'm not sure if that's the extent we'll see this partnership develop because um, the partnership could eventually hit a wall and then they stop. They sell the their stake in the company we, we don't really know obviously the fanboy or the not really fanboy but the imagination of me being like yeah it'd be cool to sign into my discord and see people who are live anywhere you know on my friends list which i'm gonna have three people on <laughs> discord um but it'd be cool to see them no matter where they're playing whether it's pc or here what they're playing or whatever it is how they're connected so i'm excited to see that stuff i think people did need to scale down just a partnership doesn't mean a buyout a partnership doesn't mean that playstation you know there's people oh playstation paid more than microsoft no microsoft has tons of money trust me they have they could uh, triple pay what sony paid i'm mean, just, just it's ridiculous so it's just i guess kind of interesting to see what they mean with this so they, you know they're going to do it for a reason this is not just a useless we're going to try to make money obviously it all comes down to money but i think this will help and it kind of bought some goodwill with people who were like, that's a cool move. That's a cool move. Not knowing what it even means, if it's going to mean anything. But I think it's an interesting one, and I think it makes a lot of sense when you look at it. Yeah, and pretty much I've had the same question pretty much since these early talks started, even with the Microsoft stuff, which is, is this all leading to some kind of integration at some point? And that integration into in the way that like Discord becomes part of Sony or uh, part of Microsoft, but in the way that can any of them work this properly into their UI or in their software in the way that maybe chat functions perform on their hardware. So is there a way to fully integrate the Discord experience into the Sony ecosystem? If you so want, you can launch that app at the same time. Uh, maybe in the way that, like, for example, you can launch Spotify and that plays in the background and then mm -hmm. you could go seamlessly into your game and that music continues. So that's a fairly integrated into the PlayStation experience if you so want. And I would see something possibly similar for Discord if this doesn't already exist. But even in a more deep way where, like, um, you can hop on Discord, sign in, have all your accounts there, have all the different Discords you're a part of, launch, hop into the voice chat there, or maybe you can have some icons dinging on your screen while you're playing your game. And uh, Sony has already played around with very interesting things there. Like, you could share the clips and stuff like that, and you could, uh, mm -hmm. they have the little guide system and stuff like that. So they're playing around with the UI in a way that they haven't played around with previously. And so I'm just curious to see if they want to integrate Discord into it at any point into the future. Um, I think that would be a smart deal, but it depends on how much connection they want to that PC ecosystem. It seems like Microsoft has a vested interest in doing that. I don't know if PlayStation feels the same way so much mm -hmm. as they see yeah, exactly. Discord being the future and they just want a piece of that pie. It can honestly be any number of those things. I'm not a shareholder at Sony. I don't, I'm not privy to their business decisions. But either way, I think punting money into this company is a smart idea, and I see why Microsoft wanted to get involved with them in the first place too as well. So I think that makes all the sense in the world. But uh, it's an interesting story. I think in many ways it's a tale of things to come, but as of right now it's kind of speculative as to what it'll turn into. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll have to see if anything. I mean... If there's something in the works, it'll be a couple years out, depending on how fast they integrate it. Definitely. All right. Uh, so something else we'll probably have to be waiting for. Uh, so PlayStation has uh, 25 upcoming 
IPs or upcoming games titles. Uh, so in an interview, uh, an interview has revealed Sony currently has 25 PlayStation 5 titles in the works, half of which are new IP. Speaking to Wired, uh, Guerrilla co-founder Herman Holtz shared the numbers and said there's an incredible amount of variety or originating from different regions in the pipeline with a mixture of big, small, different games. So this is, it's weird, there's a lot of fog that they're, I guess, trying to covering up here. Uh, what Does this include already titles we know of? Does this include uh, ports? And I know they said uh, 20 titles, half of which are new IP. What what does, what classifies as a new IP? It's pretty interesting. I think this is obviously more of a reactionary move. When I read this, I thought this was obviously a reactionary move to the whole. There's been like a small movement of people saying like, "Where are the PlayStation Five games and yeah. the, why are they so reliant on stuff?" I think Herman, this was a just a knee jerk reaction with uh, Herman Hulse being like, "Dog, we got like tons of games coming. You don't even know. Half of them are going to be new." I mean, what's the other half is what, you know, Horizon we know about, God of War we know about, you know, Ratchet we know about, does, does Ratchet count, and Ratchet's, you know, weeks away. It's it's interesting. Um, I think they're obviously going to be planning something. I, I wish, if I knew, if Sony was going to be at E3 this year or integrated somehow with E3, I'd be more excited to see some of these new titles. I don't know what this really means. It's kind of just talking out of you know thin air um because until until the work's there on paper until we see some stuff until we're playing that game it's all imaginary to me so uh what how'd you uh how'd you react to this quick statement yeah well i i was kind of like mixed on it so one thing i think it's important to make the distinction he said there's 25 upcoming games in the works he didn't say 25 upcoming games in the next three years so many of which of these it, the math makes sense if you just kind of break down what he's actually saying. So it's 25 games in the works. In the works can mean anything from pre-production to active development. It can mean a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a lot of teams under their belt, of which multiple games can be in the works at a single team. That's important to know as well. Naughty Dog can be work, have multiple things in the work and only one thing in active development. Or You know what I mean? So uh, I think that's important to know. And then, yeah, obviously some of these are going to be much smaller. Not indie titles, but, you know, to scale uh, a, a much lower experience. And then some of these things are going to be AAA. Uh, some of these could be, you know, multiple titles at Sucker Punch, multiple titles at Sony Santa Monica, and they're just in the works. I mean, what the in the works means. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like, I, I think you could go to pretty much any studio and it's like, tell me how much you have in the works, and they'll be like, I don't know, 17, 20, 25, 30. Like, I mean, the, and some of these games, I'm sure, we're not going to see until 5 to 10 years from now. I mean, these games take a long time to develop. The, the in the work thing, they, they start pre-production very, very early, oftentimes. I mean, even take a look at stuff like Cyberpunk that they started talking about that in what 2012. <laughs> so like exactly, and and that's not necessarily abnormal from what I understand. That dialogue about these things can start years and years and years before. It. By the time the game comes out, it doesn't even look the same. So though, in many ways, this is exciting to hear that like obviously their first party output uh, is something that they're fully dedicated to in that we'll have like a steady stream of stuff coming out going forward for years to come at the same time this is kind of a non-story because it's like it's like at the same time it's like yeah no ish that you know 25 games are going to be coming in the pipeline <laughs> at some point or that are yeah. in, in the works currently like i would hope so uh uh company at your scale your size with the amount of teams you have i would hope you would have around 25 at this point with the amount of teams that you have um and the amount how big some of these teams are you would hope that they're developing multiple things mm -hmm. at the same time so mm -hmm. yeah no it, it's awesome to hear that playstation has things coming but at the same time with no timeline assigned to it no look at does this include current things are these 25 what are these new ip scale wise are going to look like there's not much for me to take from this because uh again if this was 25 in the next three years oh i'm excited now now we exactly. that's a big talk but i mean if some of these we're not going to see until 2025 it'd be questionable if this is even a ps5 game i mean this is irrelevant to me to be honest with you and not to be like <laughs> cynical towards sony at all i'm just saying like i do agree with you that the story seems a little reactionary to control the narrative a little bit mm -hmm. yeah i think it's uh yeah yeah I think the same. I think they just. What are you? What are you telling me? Of course, you have games in the work. You're 
<laughs> your PlayStation. I, I just didn't see why, why like, people were trying to jump and be so proud. There's like this small council war sort of almost resurging, and I still don't understand it with the Xbox and PlayStation. And it's the fan base, not even the companies. Yeah. And I think they're just looking for ammo. And I was like, this is not anything to shoot at because there's nothing here, really. But, but hey, if there's one thing the game industry loves, it's a non-story. How <laughs> moving on from there? Um, so this story, uh, th- this is for a game that I feel like is interesting in the way that there's people who are so incredibly dedicated to any news that this comes out. This episode itself, from us talking about this, is going to draw some people over who are just looking for anything Starfield related. So mm-hmm. before I get into the story, I want to give a caveat to all the people who are here for Starfield news. Hi guys, how you doing? Please like and subscribe if you're interested in gaming. Um not much new news here guys we're just talking about the exclusivity deal that this was talked about this past week so just so you know that's all we're talking about so uh if you're like oh this is not talking about anything starfield just because every time we've talked about starfield this has happened so just a heads up to them uh so right now we're going to talk about the xbox exclusivity uh for starfield so industry insider and journalist jeff grubb caused a stir last night when he said uh what everybody was thinking that he can confirm that starfield bethesda's next big sci-fi game will be xbox exclusive now obviously this is a very interesting story because that was pretty much the one question everybody's had pretty much since that bethesda acquisition or partnership or whatever you want to call it um is this how is this going to affect exclusivity are these games ever going to be on playstation consoles going forward uh and they've been very dodgy about those answers uh if you ask phil spencer he's like ah it's up to bethesda if you ask bethesda they're like well i mean maybe for some things maybe not for others what does that mean we don't know so they're not really giving us much insight into what the nature of this deal is going to ever look like and so anybody who really paid attention was guess that it's like there are absolutely going to be certain exclusive things however it doesn't seem that microsoft is fighting too hard for the major triple a exclusives however this seems to push in the opposite direction where like starfield i mean you don't get much bigger than that this is proper bethesda game studios output here um the only thing bigger from their output at this point maybe would be the new upcoming elder scrolls game where personally i mean i'll put money down i might be wrong but i don't think there's a chance in hell that's an xbox exclusive however starfield that's kind of interesting um so yeah we're getting a little bit of look at maybe bethesda's and microsoft's approach to this deal that there's going to be some large scale exclusivity but it's not going to be something across the board that they're locked on uh what are your thoughts on this yeah you know and i i stand by most of the stuff we've discussed because this has been like you said since the day this was announced this has always been the back and forth um it makes sense if if it's just if this is true and starfield is is, is exclusive uh it makes sense you know new ip there's not like this fan base that's gonna upturn you know crazy stuff like like if elder scrolls came out and it was only on xbox which would be insane uh, which i'd love i would love that just to happen just to see the <laughs> the blowback but you know this is a new ip that needs to prove itself that can help maybe push some consoles and some of that those memberships and stuff like that because you don't have that loyal fan base on competing you know competitors um it's obviously gonna come to pc as well that's all one thing for microsoft the Switch probably can't run Starfield anyway, so... Um, oh, no doubt. <laughs> so, it just would make sense, and I had some time to think about it. I hope it's exclusive. I Not just because I have both systems, but I hope it's exclusive, because I would love to have this sort of... me bouncing back between my two systems with reason, not just because, you know, oh, I got Mass Effect here, so I'm going to play it here. No, I... Listen, this is the only place I can get this, is on my Xbox, and I would love that. So, it makes a lot of sense, but, I mean... I feel like it's time we hear something about Starfield, uh, maybe E3 in, in a few weeks. Um, who really knows? But this makes a lot of sense to me. But I, until we get a confirmation, I know Jeff Grubb is an insider. and Even him, if you look back some of his other stuff, he was always very unsure. Um, I just want what changed that now he can confidently say that. You know, that, that's the story I want. But I'm yeah. nerd and I like the, the drama <laughs> the behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah, so we'll see. Yeah. And, oh, I did also want to comment. So, like, obviously, I completely understand the frustration certain people have with the whole exclusive thing. How, uh, I mean, ideally, everybody would love to be able to play whatever they want, wherever they want. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important. People need to keep that same energy because I see a lot of anger towards Microsoft. Like, how dare you 
take this game from us and allow us to play from the PlayStation gamers. And I just want to say, keep that same energy because I didn't see people talking like that when Final Fantasy was yanked out of the rest of the industry's ability to play for, for PlayStation. And um, Still, and it's still not there. Exactly, and, and when people are talking about like, oh, well, like 16 is only going to be like a timed exclusive or something like that. What's the timeline then? Tell me. Tell, tell me when Xbox is going to be able to play this <laughs> freaking game. So I think it's important that we keep the same energy that it's like as annoying as exclusivity can be or timed exclusivity or whatever you want to say. It's it's the nature of the beast, man. This is why they buy these companies. It's why they they want to sell people on these consoles and give people a reason. So you can't in one breath say, oh, there's no games on Xbox. Xbox needs to find a reason to allow people to want to even play their console in the first place. And then when they try to find a reason to have people play their console in the first place, they're like, wait a minute, you can't do that. So it's it, I, I understand you guys want exclusives I guess on the Microsoft ecosystem to be locked to that first party. Uh, I guess the the Halos and the Gears and stuff like that. But congratulations! I mean, Bethesda is first party now, so uh, I mean, I think it's well within their rights to ask them of that. And again, I understand that we come from a privileged position that no matter where something pops up, in the un- unless it pops up on like a Stadia or something like that, we'll be able to play it <laughs> one way or another. Yeah. And that I mean, obviously that was a joke because Stadia exclusives don't exist, but um. Not to take another shot at them. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. And uh, also for people getting on Phil's butt and saying that, like, oh, I thought you said you didn't care about exclusives and stuff like that. That They also said that that's a Bethesda call. And now do I, did I always think it was a tad disingenuous that he was saying he doesn't care about exclusives? Of course. It, it, of course they care about exclusives. I mean, they otherwise they'd become just a fully software company and just, allow people to play what halo on a playstation if they really didn't care um mm-hmm. so obviously that that's not 100 percent true but ultimately i mean hey if, if them and bethesda come to a deal and it's like bethesda wants to do it xbox is down to do it, it, it it's a win-win scenario for them i don't think it's a terrible idea plus with the game pass subscribers i think the play rate is going to be pretty pretty high too so it's going to be a great opportunity for them to expose a new ip to as many people in the xbox ecosystem as possible uh, because a lot of people have Game Pass, so we're talking about millions and millions of people. So I don't think it's a bad business decision. I understand the frustration to it, but uh, I think it's important for people to understand how this industry works and to s- sometimes check your biases a little bit. And it's like if you weren't mad about when PlayStation did it, don't be mad about when Xbox did it because that's not necessarily fair. So I thought that was just important to mention. No, that's that's completely true. I mean, Xbox. I mean, only Sony PlayStation Four. And five owners can play Final Fantasy VII Remake right now. It's not even on PC, to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, and I remember on I got a physical Final Fantasy VII Remake later, and there's a sticker on it. I peeled it off. That said, timed exclusive. And we're, what, a year after? Two years after? Yeah. Almost? Nothing. Where it at, though? We're getting now another timed exclusive with the re- the integrate and stuff like that. So Where was the nuclear it's... meltdown when Nintendo took Bayonetta? Like, come on, guys. Like, this is yeah, the game exactly. sometimes, man. <laughs> it's just what happens. It is what it is sometimes. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next story. PlayStation VR 2 reported leaks. Obviously, I'm, it's a little bit more into my boat. I'm a little bit more not ex- not experienced, I guess, in VR. But uh, I have a little bit more experience because you physically can't do much yeah, VR. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... It's all rumors and stuff like that. Some of this stuff will, I mean, we'll get into it. Uh, PlayStation VR 2 will reportedly include a 4K display, eye tracking, haptic feedback, and more according to a newly published report. Upload VR cites multiple reliable resources um, on the matter who say that Sony has shared details with its partners about the PSVR 2 features. The report suggests that the new version of the headset could feature 4000 by 2040 pixels, resolution, gaze tracking, and lens separation adjustment detail, a feature that can be seen on the Valve Index headset. The 4K resolution would be a big step up from the original PSVR, which has a 960, it's a 1080 display. A uh, small step up uh, on um, the popular Oculus Quest 2. Uh, eye tracking within the headset would allow for forvated render, uh, rendering, a technique that allows VR experience to reduce the quality of rendering in the player's peripheral vision, essentially allowing for developers to increase the quality of what players actually see. Another feature mentioned in the report is haptic feedback which the report suggests could be implemented via motor in the headset and, and would complement the headset's new controllers, which also feature haptic feedback. We also see that in the DualSense. Uh, yeah, DualSense. 
Um, an onboard camera would track the position of the controllers, reducing the amount of peripherals needed to make the headset work. Another small note mentioned in the report is that the headset will reportedly connect to the PlayStation 5 via a single USB-C cable. Beautiful. So, this is obviously a techie's biggest dream. Obviously, if yeah. of course, if I want the strongest, most valuable PSVR 2, this is what it would be. Um, you're looking at... A couple hundred dollars if this was to be true i don't believe the display will be 4k i don't think it needs to be 4k um i don't i don't understand what haptic feedback in the headset would do i think that's probably some nonsense as well um, i don't want vibrations in my head or you know all that kind of stuff um so yeah a lot of the stuff sounds good a lot of it is on par like i said with what stuff they're stating with oculus quest 2 and the valve and all these other headsets it's pretty much on board with that. Again, I don't think it needs a 4K display. I don't don't think it really needs all this extra gimmicking of tracking my eyes to so it can display the peripherals and stuff because that's not really how those headsets work. You're always going to kind of see a border. Um, this is not dot hack or anything like that. So it's <laughs> some some interesting stuff, some powerful stuff. Until we really see anything, a lot of the stuff could be pulled from almost you know when they do. The trademarks and all those other things until we see it, it don't get me wrong it sounds great i would love to have this super powerful psvr2 i don't think one single usb-c cable works the way they want but also i look back the ps5 doesn't really have much else so i mean there's the two usb spots i think one in the back or two in the back and one in the front so i don't know how that would exactly would work i don't again it depends how much hardware they were able to put in the headset so I know you probably won't purchase a PSVR 2, but uh, what do you think of some of these uh, quote-unquote leaks? Yeah, uh, unfortunately. And again, as a video game super fan, the fact that I can't fully dive into VR drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I really want this, but obviously there are limitations, and my motion sickness is only getting worse with age. I don't know why, but it's getting worse. So, um, yeah, I definitely won't be able to get this, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. but I mean, it sounds awesome from what i'm hearing here however when i'm reading all these details and I'm, I'm reading this story this all i'm hearing over and over again is expensive if this is true if we're talking about these 4k displays and all this crazy stuff like i don't i don't see how they can competitively price this under 500 and stuff like that unless they're willing to take a massive loss on it which is entirely possible um but yeah no this just sounds incredibly expensive uh i'm so glad that they were able to what an upgrade, though, uh, in terms of the wiring situation. I mean, the first mm -hmm. one is a wiring nightmare. And the fact yep. that they're like, this can connect to PlayStation with a single USB-C cable. I mean, that, that that's from like one end of the spectrum to the other, which is, I mean, pretty incredible. Considering the amount of time, too, we're not talking about like a 10-year difference in, in hardware here. So they were able to really upgrade this stuff. And it seems like uh, they're really giving a re reason to people to, to upgrade to this. So if you have a VR1 and... Nobody's going to look at this thing. If this is true, nobody's going to look at this thing and be like, okay, but what's different than the one I have at home? <laughs> this sounds like a night and day yeah. difference, which is awesome. Um, and so I, I'm also curious at this point about timeline-wise where they're planning on launching this. Is this like a first half 2022 type thing? Is this as soon as like end of 2021? Which is unlikely in my vision, but uh, I think this is going to be a little bit of time before we we see this especially the fact that it's already um may at this point so we're almost at the midpoint of 2021 at this point and they we're getting detailed about what this thing is even is let alone when this would be revealed or when mm -hmm. this is coming out what the launch lineup is going to be when production is going to start obviously when production starts though it's going to start leaking you know how it looks and stuff like that so we're it doesn't seem like we're anywhere close to that process yet so i would be surprised if this comes out anywhere between like at, I think as soonest a year from now is as soon as we start hearing about this thing in a real way that you know consumers get their hand on it and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm liking what I hear. I'm curious to see how the games take advantage of this new hardware upgrades and stuff like that. 4K seems excessive to me, uh, mm -hmm. not in a way that it's uh, it shouldn't happen, but it just seems like insane tech to put in uh, to something like this and be able to price it under a thousand dollars realistically i mean 4k is not cheap 
Uh, there's a reason why, and there's multiple reasons, but there's many reasons why, like, the Switch is not 4K and stuff like that. Obviously, there's power draw issues, but there's pricing issues as well. I mean, uh, you don't just get a 4K display that can be integrated into a VR headset for, you know, 300 bucks, 250 bucks. Like, I don't, that's not happening, uh, especially with these really brand new controllers, too, so they're not relying on those kind of PS3 era move controllers. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is... I I, feel, I can't help but think that they're going to try to tap in a little bit into the higher end stuff then too that maybe what like a Vive was doing at some point uh, with this. But I don't necessarily think that's the best business standpoint because I feel like uh, the original PlayStation VR was that machine that people could buy into an ecosystem they otherwise couldn't have other like afforded pretty much. It was that entry point for people. So it was quality hardware for a decent price that already integrated into a console that you probably already had. Uh, if this has all this crazy tech and is super expensive from that point and they don't want to operate on the loss, which realistically no business really wants to take a massive loss because I'm sure they're already taking a loss on the console like they usually do. Mm-hmm. Or maybe it's just profitable, but I doubt it. And they make up for it on software sales. And everybody knows that VR games don't sell the highest because the hardware acquisition uh, rates are not massive as well. So it's a tricky business proposition where it's like you can't go too expensive because then you're fundamentally misunderstanding why the first one was so successful. But at the same time, it's like they got to make up the money somewhere. So I, I'm mixed on this. It's not an ecosystem I know a ton about, so it's a lot of speculation on my part. Yeah, you know, I, I won't go too deep into it. Like, I won't believe into it sony's been surprisingly just upfront with vr news like they'll be just random blog posts be like here's the information you know that's how they announced it they just blog post here it is blog post here are the controllers so uh, i'm assuming that'll be the same sort of format when it comes time to see the actual headset it'll be like hey here's that 30 second weird trailer they do that shows their hardware and stuff so that's when I can believe a little bit more. But yeah, that pricing is a big one that I keep wearing. I hear all this, I'm just like, hey, I, I I love to be Sony and I love VR, but if it's too up there, I just can't do it and I won't do it. So Yeah, the way they roll these things out is a little strange. Uh, especially like with, yeah, they just put out like the controller kind of out of nowhere. It's like, yeah, this is the controller for the VR too. And it just kind of reminded, you know, they actually did the same thing with the PS5 too because I remember they just showed us the DualSense. And I was like, oh, okay, well, all right. We don't even That's know how true. this console I, like. Yeah, they just show I, off the console. A like, random afternoon at 3, yeah. and I'm like... The controller is just like, yeah, here you go. Next-gen controller. And it's like, oh, crap, okay. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're weird about that sometimes where they just mm-hmm. take a random part of a heart, the console setup and say, yeah, here you go. Throw, throw, throw you a bone. So, yeah, I don't... It doesn't surprise me. I wouldn't be surprised if they just, at the end of a state of play, it's like, oh, and here's VR too. Shown off. Here's the yeah. Board. Here's our first look, <laughs> and then they'll probably do a deep dive after that point. But I, I feel like, in many ways, the first announcement of it, or the f- formal showing it off for the first time, is probably going to be like strangely unceremonious because that's how Sony is for some reason. Yeah, they're like playing it low, <laughs> keeping it low. Yeah, and I, and and in many ways, I feel like don't you want your don't you want the most pomp and circumstance around your reviews as possible? But at the same time. We know how Sony can be, especially when they're doing well. And they're like, do we even need to? Like, they, they really like to <laughs> talk that talk. So I, it, yeah. it doesn't necessarily <laughs> surprise me that they'd be like, man, we could drop it in a blog post and you're still going to buy it. And it's at the same time, as much as I'm like, no, but that's him. It's like, yeah, yeah, I, I am. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So I guess we can move on to the next story. This is a really interesting one. We got a little bit of Nintendo news here. This is about the mm-hmm. Illumination CEO uh, joining Nintendo in some capacity. So uh, Chris Mel- Melodandry, CEO of American Am- Animation Studio Illumination, has been nominated to join Nintendo as an outside director. So Melodandry, whose company is responsible for Minions, Despicable Me, and the upcoming Mario animated movie, is anticipated to join the company following approval of the position at the Nintendo's 81st annual general meeting of shareholders. That meeting is set to be held on June 29, 2021, according to Nintendo's latest financial report. As an outside director, Melon Dandry will be a non-executive and likely part of the company to provide advice rather than solidify strategy and decisions. 
Uh, Nintendo currently has three outside directors, but Mel and Dandry will be the first American citizen to hold the position. So that this is another story that I feel like was a little bit misreported. Or not misreported, mm-hmm. but people were kind of running with a narrative related to the story that was a little bit false. So he's not formally joining Nintendo in the way that he's going to be making decisions on the business overall but he seems like he's going to be consulting them kind of a, a, on an external level and this to me just signals their commitment to bring working with illumination in many ways to bring their uh properties to cinemas pretty much and i always felt like the mario illumination movie was a brilliant idea i thought that was the exact format that a mario story should be told illumination incredible animation studios i'm not the biggest despicable me fan however i can 100 percent respect the production quality of their movies even if it's not really my cup of tea and i've like seen the movies here and there and that's one i've never walked away from it being being like oh that was animated poorly like no their movies look incredible and so i have no doubt that this is going to be a quality thing that they put together with nintendo and so this to me just signals that there's more to come between these two companies working together which i think is an awesome thing because i would love like a nintendo cinematic universe to be honest with you uh if if we could see like a mario and maybe that can kind of spawn off into like maybe a kirby movie and then maybe we can have ourselves a zelda movie Mm -hmm. and that can all kind of climax to like smash bros or something like that like how awesome would Uh, that be i'd lose my mind i would go absolutely nuts and i know that might sound silly to some people it's like no they're not building a cinematic universe but it's like why why wouldn't they if anybody could pull it off it could be them they they literally did a gaming cinematic universe so they could easily do a, a um a cinematic one so yeah no good for them i think it's awesome i think this is great to bring him in and i just hope it leads to more personally uh but who knows it might not lead to anything and it might just be bringing them on for at any point in the future they might want to work with him but i I think this is a sign of good things to come what do you think yeah the same i i mean when i was reading this i was like well that must mean this upcoming mario movie is doing well they must be working well with each other if they're going to start pretty much solidifying these partnerships and going that extra step you know of having them as an outside director you know putting his two cents in and stuff like that so it, it just means at least to me the way i saw it i was like well that must mean things are going well and they like what they are seeing or being reported anyway so i think it's a smart move and i think it's a, you know the same i don't care for the minions and, and all those movies but it's not the animation it's the content that i don't yeah. like so i like the mario content i like that animation so it sort of fits together already in my mind so We'll have to, uh, I guess we'll have to see. I mean, I always forget that this Mario animated movie is existing. Yeah, I wonder um, how far along it is. It's, I feel like it's just been sort of that thing that's always been there. It was like the Sonic movie that was just constantly, so. oh yeah, they're working on it. They're working on it. And we went from Chris Pratt to the dude we have now. So it's such a weird time for these things on top of the COVID delays and all that stuff. Because this is obviously going to be this big theoretical theater release and stuff. So. Oh yeah, for sure. So we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see until... We see what comes of this. I mean, yeah. I mean, in the perfect world, yeah. At the end of the Mario movie, there's a smash ball falls out of a box, and then we all lose our mind. Oh, you doubt think it, but it off early. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. I just think it would be amazing. Where's that Star I'll, Fox I'll... movie? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Where's that Star Fox game? So, not true. <laughs> all right. Uh, so those are games we have to wait for, and information we have to wait for. So things that uh, Sega may have some answers for uh so sega reboots a financial results presentation has revealed that sega is considering reboots of crazy taxi big fan Uh, you i know you're a huge fan oh yes jet set radio and other dormant ip while he begins to work while he begins work on a super game Uh, a results presentation to mark the end of the fiscal year was published to the sega sammy investor relations website today uh the slideshow includes a number of interesting details about the company's future plans one slide concerns the utilization of ip assets noting that ips are active and dormant and how sega plans to remaster remake or reboot its older series to capitalize on the globally recognized ips it has in its fault a number of old fan favorite franchises are mentioned in the past ip group section including crazy taxi jet set radio knights space channel 5 panzer dragon and res at the very least this suggests that the company is interested in bringing back some of these games back to the market while strengthening its active ips such as yakuza which now has its own spin-off persona and sonic 
The presentation also mentions Sega's five-year plan to release what it calls a super game, while unclear exactly what that term implies. Uh, Sega says it's focused; it's mar it's making focused investment in the project and aims to have it released by the, its 2026 fiscal year. As well as turning its existing active IPs into global brands, the company wants to create new IP which can be expanded globally, uh, which doesn't expect to be immediately highly profitable. No details were given on such on which of Sega Studios would make the game, nor what kind of game it would be. So yeah, pretty much this, you know, Sega's been in, in the background for a while, and then they came out with this huge amount of news on, you know, there's this five-year plan they want to do, these IPs that have been sitting forever. They haven't even done, like, a Dreamcast collection in a long time or any sort of Sega collection in a long time. Um, but they obviously know that the fan bases are there, and it's exciting to see that they want to do something with it. To what extent? I don't know. To sequels, I don't know. Reboots, we don't know. But the fact is they know they have to do something with it and they need, should do something with it. Because I think now is the time where every game doesn't need to be a $70 critical blockbuster hit. And I think they have the IPs to scale that as well. Um, I, I don't know what a $70 crazy taxi game would look like, but I do know what a $30 crazy taxi game would look like and it would be great. Um, so super exciting news. I know we're both actually pretty big fans fans of most of these franchises we know that persona yakuza sonic those are always kind of being in rotation but these you know i love jet set radio i remember we've talked about this i think early on when we started the show how much we love jet set radio um nights i like the aesthetic i've never understood the gameplay um so it's interesting to see that finally these things that have always been staples in sega can maybe be staples again and stand up there with this other catalog so uh what do you uh what do you think of this what do you think of all the sega news yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, really awesome. We're both pretty big Sega fans. Sega has a lot of eras. So, you know, on the top of the story, you're like, okay, so what... They want to really come back in a strong way and, you know, bring their stuff back to the forefront. What era of Sega are we talking about? And it seems like they're really uh, nailing down specifically that kind of, like, 98 to 2003 era. So right up until, like, right before the GameCube, and they kind of dumped everything there. Uh, so yeah, it, it seems like we're getting Dreamcast era stuff, maybe uh, some Saturn era stuff into you know, and then that's kind of where they're locked for right now, because uh, they've they've shown a lot of love to the Genesis era stuff too. So it's really awesome to see a little bit of like late Sega, and I know Sega's still around, but when they were hardware manufactured, that was obviously a very different Sega than what we have now. It's really awesome to see them show some love to that thing, and I, I'm just excited to see them give the AAA treatment to. I mean, just the fact that they're acknowledging Knights is so awesome to me. Because um, uh, the last time they, they touched Knights, I think it was like on Wii or something like that. It was years yeah, ago. Yeah, I believe so. It was crazy long ago. I mean, Jet Set Radio, we've talked about this before, but I feel like Jet Set Radio is probably, in my opinion, the most primed to come back out of all of these, uh, personally, because I just feel like it's been such a massive inspiration to so many games nowadays. And I, the the closest analog that i've talked about in the past and i know this is a stretch to some people but i've always seen a lot of jet set radio's energy in splatoon and so i feel like it, it's time to bring jet set radio back in a real way i just i mean 4k in a fully realized city with that beautiful artwork and style and just imagine it running so cleanly on like a playstation 5 like how I, i'm super excited about that crazy taxi is an interesting one because of how arcadey the gameplay style is and that's a, a number of these is the style is very that era so i'm very curious to see how you could even bring that back crazy taxi again is what does crazy taxi look like in a world where forza exists you know what i mean like it's yeah. just the world is in a very different place for specifically even and i mean like an arcade car game nowadays doesn't mean crazy taxi it means dirt five so um the world has changed profoundly since crazy taxi was popping i mean the last crazy taxi game that i bought new i think was on like psp or something like that which i think was fair wars that was the last one i bought and there was a spinoff that came out not a spinoff but like kind of a spiritual successor that came out not too long ago that i still have yet to get i'm probably going to get on xbox within the next few weeks and i'll have some details to report on you for, to you for that i don't even know if that one's good or not but i do want to try it um 
so yeah i think it, it's time for them to bring this back i'm really excited to see that sega is alive and well and dedicated to making video games uh sega's like the thing i always have in the back of my mind that i'm a little nervous for i'm like you guys doing okay like i just i want i always want output from them because their ip is so amazing and they're luckily for them they're willing to do stuff for them because there are other companies that have amazing ip that are not doing things with them uh, like for example konami and so i'm just glad that they're not sitting on them and it's like we know we have this amazing heritage mm -hmm. uh and we're willing to give it a shot and what i love about sega is that they're malleable and they're willing to do what they got to do to get it out so like even when everything was collapsing and their hardware wasn't selling they knew they had great ip that they could make money so what did they do they sucked it up they put their pride to the side and they just put it on gamecube and that was a decision that i don't i don't know if i can name a single company who would have did something like that and mm -hmm. so you got to give respect to sega that they're, they're they're willing to do what makes it work they're willing to work with whoever they need to to ensure that players can have their hands on amazing video games and yeah they're still active with you know yakuza persona it was funny hearing them call uh sonic like an active ip because i mean i suppose it is but it's like <laughs> it feels like a while even though it hasn't yeah. been it feels like a while i know forces wasn't that long ago but it feels and, and mania. I mean that I only give them half credit for that because again, fan game, whatever. But um, it feels like forever since like a proper AAA mainline Sonic game has come out. But uh, yeah, no, this is all good news for me, and I'm curious to see what it turns like. But again, they're talking about like 2026 fiscal financial year, so it, it can be a number of years before we start seeing this stuff fully come out. This is pretty much them talking about their plans for the entire a seeming like game life cycle of this this console generation pretty much uh and super game i don't know what the hell that means i have nothing to say about that because i don't know what the hell that means pretty much mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly weird uh weird timing and weird phrasing but we'll see what this means this super sega game but hey at any the fact that there are ambitious plans for sega in 2021 i think is an amazing thing and uh i think if you would have gone 10 15 years in the past and be like where do you think sega is you know in 10 15 years i mean i think a vast majority of people would have been like dead in the water <laughs> nintendo owns all their ip and they are just a remnant of they, they are sunsoft they're gone um <laughs> and lo and behold they're still here they're still kicking they they're making money they're doing their thing and uh that's absolutely commendable and and the fact that sega in 2021 is existing and making money but their primary ip is not sonic anymore no, which is, is very interesting the fact that that's not really the case anymore they're they're they have ownership and they are they publish i mean massive games like yakuza and persona i mean this, these are massive games and obviously persona is more inherently linked to like like atlas for example but i mean hey sega's got a part of that too so um yeah yeah no this is awesome stuff so I guess we can move on to our second to last story, uh, and this is a Ubisoft update. Uh, so during Ubisoft's annual earning call, the company shared some interesting information about what types of game it plans to release. As it seems, Ubisoft will focus on creating more high-end free-to-play games, gross, while keeping its yearly <laughs> output of three to four AAA games. Moreover, it posted a new record sales figure and announced that the pirate ship simulator Skull and Bones, please cancel it, was delayed once again, now set to release in 2022 to 2023. Uh, although Ubisoft CFO Frederick du, Duge, du, Duguet, I don't know, uh, <laughs> stated that the company is moving from the previous commitment of releasing three to four premium AAA games per year, he clarified that this does not mean reducing our AAA offering. So they're scaling up, if anything. Um, additionally, we are building high-end free-to-play games that to be trending towards AAA ambitions over the long term, Frederick uh, added, by the end of this fiscal year, which finishes on March 31st, 2022, the publisher expects to release multiple games including Far Cry 6, Rainbow Six Quarantine, Riders Republic, The Division, Heartland, and Roller Champions. So a lot of interesting news here that we kind of get a glimpse into the thinking over there at Ubisoft. So apparently they're interesting they're trying to introduce more high-end free-to-play games but not at the expense of their triple-a output which is i mean that's that's big that means they they feel like they have the bandwidth to be able to scale up that large and they're going to maintain their yearly output um 
I didn't see them throw in no Assassin's Creed there, so they, they better keep those coming too because I'm loving what they're doing there. Uh, this Skull and Bones thing, I don't understand. I've I've seen I've seen the what they've released about it and I just don't get it and I don't understand what's so profoundly complicated about the development of this game that requires this amount of delays. I don't understand. Um yeah, but I'm. I think if they can handle it, and this doesn't come at the expense of quality of their AAA, you know, releases. The ones that I love the most, jumping into, I love their Far Cry games. Uh, some of the Rainbow Six games are actually pretty pretty solid. I don't have any problem with them. Um, I love me some Assassin's Creed. Watch Dogs can hit when it hits when it's not a freaking stinker like the that last one was. But. Um, yeah, no, uh, I'm mixing news here. I'm kind of, like, mixed. I, I don't like the free-to-play thing. That makes me really nervous because free-to-play, obviously, they make their money on microtransactions. And microtransactions, I know, is, like, a trigger word in the gaming ex industry. That can mean cosmetic. That can mean game altering. That can mean a lot of different things. It's super not my world. I don't like it. Um, what do you think about this story? So, yeah, you know, it's... For us, it was almost sort of <laughs> sad news. Um, it was like, again, it was mixed feeling. It was like, because, you, you know, they start off, obviously, with like, oh, we're going to be focused on creating more high-end free-to-play. And immediately that's, when I see something's free-to-play, I immediately just put my head down. I'm like, like uh -oh. not, not for me. Uh, Skull and Bones has been being delayed for so long now. Now it's being forced into the next, next year. Like, what is going on there? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> at the point that they've been working at Skull and Bones, you know, Xbox and Rare released their pirate game, did terrible, fixed Was that pirate Thieves, game. Right? Sea of Thieves, that's what I said. I couldn't think of it. They released Sea of Thieves, nobody liked it. They fixed Sea of Thieves, and now people actually like it. For sure. And Skull and Bones is still MIA, and we've seen or heard nothing. You know, you and I are such big fans of Ubisoft, and even like sometimes they're random games we don't think we would need. There was that. Um, shooter we got into late earlier this year or maybe it was last year it was one of the tom clancy's oh uh it is tom clancy ghost it was the ghost recon one breakpoint or something like that breakpoint breakpoint that's the one yeah. you know so they have such a variety of titles and stuff like that that we think this is going to be really cool that's we do see some of this sort of falling out stuff putting these games way too close together i think assassin's creed has become too big uh Watch Dogs is, <laughs> yeah, it's it's they're all right. Um, they were, they were it's, doing uh, so well with Watch Dogs too. I don't know what the hell happened. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I don't know what went on with that. Again, I played the game once and that was <laughs> and that was it. Um, so it's it feels like they're doing some restructuring. Um, I don't think it should be. I don't think it's the right move. Uh, we, again, this is so just there's just such a a weird mix going on over there because we have now we've seen a little bit of the division free to play and then we've seen some of these other things that looked kind of cool riders republic and these are things i hope don't go to free to play last second there was that battle royale they did for some reason <laughs> that immediately flopped and died um i just don't understand what they're doing um i i, I don't know what exactly they're looking at they want to keep with its yearly three to four titles a year i think that's good if you were to do it right though um, because you have to, re you know, they re they released Assassin's Creed and Watch Dogs pretty close together uh, last year, and the w I mean, the year's kind of running out. We're already in May, um, so in these next six months or so, really, you don't really release many titles past October. In that time, you still have to release Far Cry Six, um, Rainbow Six Quarantine, and all these other little things you have going on. So I just don't understand what their timeline looks like, and where's the story with what's going on with ubisoft i understand ubisoft was in the news for different things but game wise what's going on over there that it's falling apart is is the schedule screwed up is this whole crunch and are they gonna blame the covid thing i just don't understand and i know they say they're not going to reduce the triple a offering it's not going to affect it i think it is we're already seeing a tons of microtransactions come up in their games um after valhalla was out they came and shoved microtransactions into that game yeah. so I don't understand when they're going to tell us, oh, don't worry, it's not going to affect it, when it's already kind of leaking into it. And before we know it, it's going to be all over our plates, and then what do we have? So it's something to keep our eyes on, because as soon as Ubisoft starts doing 
too much nonsense, it's time to start speaking up and voting with your wallet because I will quickly not purchase one of the games if I don't feel justified to do it. Yeah, and as someone who's paid attention to Ubisoft for quite a bit, so have you, I feel like there's this like contraction and expansion thing that they do where they are doing well so they expand and they expand and they get bigger and they get bigger and they bigger and then things start suffering and they start to be pushed back and they start to be blowback and their games start suffering and so they contract and they contract and they contract and then they hit a zone where people are like oh yeah they they finally got back to the spirit of what they were doing they pared it down they didn't they're not dropping a million games a year they're giving assassin's creed a chance to breathe so they contracted and they start doing well and and people are like yeah ubisoft is good again and then like, oh, we're good again? Okay, expand, 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 expand. Mm-hmm. And that's where we are right now, where I think they contract it. Because if you remember years ago, they, they almost freaking killed Assassin's Creed because they were just putting them out constantly. They didn't give themselves a chance to breathe. And there's obviously financial reasons to why they do that. And I feel like sometimes their financial ambitions uh, affect the quality of their output. And, and that's not a advanced you know concept there. But they... And then they contracted. And they're like, you know what? We're going to treat things with a little bit of care. We're going to give some things some time to breathe. We're not going to put watchdogs after watchdogs. After. No, we're going to space them out a little bit. We're going to space out Assassin's Creed. We're going to treat Division with respect and put out a lot of quality DLC. And we're just going to space things out and give a chance to breathe, support all our games. And they started doing well again. And now they're starting to expand again in the way that I felt like they were expanding back in the day. Uh, when you know Assassin's Creed was finally getting some leverage the first time and we're about to head into a place I feel like where there's going to be blowback because things are going to start suffering again and uh, I just worry about that and also where the hell is Far Cry 6 give me that give me a date on that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what the hell happened there they just delayed it into oblivion because it, it was supposed to launch in what, like February or something like that? I think I'm actually gonna look it up right now. I yeah, believe it was supposed I, to be. I believe that was my February game for like I was like, oh, new console, fresh of 2021. I'm gonna be able to play Far Cry, and then they didn't just delay it; they delayed it into like nothingness. Like I don't even know With where no it's date. coming. Nothing. It's just gone, and I'm just and I think there is a cutoff bef- where it needs to be out by what they said. And I think that's September, if I'm not mistaken. So it's coming out sometime before September. So it's going to be a summer game, most likely. Um, and luckily for us, we're in the midpoint of May. So that has to be under three months away. But, uh, yeah, no, it, 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 there's weird stuff going on there. And I just, I hate to see them go through this back and forth. Because I feel like they just can't keep that momentum. They, there's such a large operation with so many IPs. And they see so much success. But I have... I, think they have trouble with success almost like like they start doing so well and they're like oh (laughs) we need to cash in on this and then they kill it immediately and uh i feel like that's a little bit of like ea in them like they have that little i think ubisoft and ea are not necessarily comparable because ea has its own subset issues but i think ubisoft has like like ea and remission like it's like it's like always in them like 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 they got ea herpes like it's always in them and there's (laughs) flare-ups sometimes you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, it's and very, very it's true. Not, it's not something that affects them all the time. But, like, when it affects them, it's like, man, like, it's almost like an inevitable. Like, it's coming at some point. And, uh, and it sucks because I love Ubisoft so much because I feel like when they they do it, they do it well. I love the Far Cry games. I love the Assassin's Creed games. I love what um, Watch Dogs was becoming. Like, I love the vision. They have so many games that I think are really, really awesome. But they just, they have trouble maintaining it sometimes. And so, uh. I have my eye on them because I feel like we're on the precipice of where we were with them before that great restructuring they had to do uh, back in the day a couple years ago, if that, if, if that makes any sense. No, I think it absolutely does. And I think it is. And, it, and you wrapped it up perfectly with this sort of back and forth that they do where they start to escalate and then they can't, they can't handle it. And then they fall, stumble, and do the wrong stuff. So hopefully this is not too much of a stumble. I hope they start to look back at this and be like, well, maybe let's not focus on these free to play. Let's focus on these other titles we've been working on for what seems to be like forever. Yeah, Ubisoft's kind of best off when they're coming off of the year where everybody hated them, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know. I, last year for them was sort of a mix. I know Valhalla did really well. Yeah. Watch Dogs did not. And that was really their only outing last year. So it's like a lukewarm. So it's like they can go either way now. Fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll, we'll hope. 
we'll hope that they get themselves together. But uh, someone who's not getting themselves together for the final story here. <laughs> Uh, Jabal, despite what we think, despite, despite what the world th- not thinks, despite what we know, Google claims Stadia is alive and well. Um, <laughs> despite the closure of Stadia Games and Entertainment, Google's internal development studio, uh, the streaming service Google Stadia is, quote-unquote, alive and well. De- uh, uh, developer marketing lead Nate Ahim said, Ahim, Ahern? 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 Uh, told GamesIndustry.biz that Stadia is doing just fine in the face of all the turbulence. In fact, the Hearn called attention to recent game launches on the Stadia platform as evidence as its wealth. We're well on our way to over 100 new games launching on Stadia in 2021, and we're continuing to make Stadia a great place to play games on devices you already own. Ahern said, I'd tell any non-believers to take notice of how we're continuing to put our words into action. As we grow the Stadia Makers program and partner with AAA studios like Capcom, EA, Square Enix, Ubisoft, and others. So, first of all, we all know this is a load of nonsense. Uh, so many people have left Stadia. They're bound to competitors. We have some people in uh, PlayStation. So we have people all over the place. Um, and all over the globe, they've, they've spread out. Um, I, I understand it's Ahern's job, I guess, to sort of not say Stadia's done. Uh, we're on our way over 100 new games launching on Stadia 2021. That's kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing because uh didn't star wars uh fall in order just launch on stadia does that count as a launch Thank it's you. a it's a whole bunch of nonsense so we've beat this constantly stadia but the thing is if they're gonna keep lying and saying that it's doing more than fine we're gonna call them out on it so Jabra, how, how are you feeling with stadia well that's the thing when i first saw the story um I know exactly what this is, and the reason why the story doesn't make sense to us because it's not for us. They're not talking to us. This is two mm-hmm. investors right here. Yep. They're basically like, don't, no, don't, don't worry, everything's fine here. And I'm sure there are numbers in the background because you can't just lie to investors. So there might be like, hey, there are reasons to be excited and stuff like that. So yes, it is alive in the way that uh, um, Google hasn't shut them down, and well is a subjective thing. So, uh, well, is we have things on the pipeline. I suppose if your metric is we have games that are coming to our platform in some capacity, are are there games that people will actually play, though, is the, the question. Obviously, no. Um, and it, it's tricky because Stadia, again, ha- is, is dabbling in a technology that I think absolutely has a massive place in the future of gaming. No doubt about that. However, their model is still all the way wrong. And they just, it's just not going to work. It's not happening with Stadia. Um, and forgive me, Google, if I don't believe your alive and well statement when you lay off half mm-hmm. your freaking staff related to Stadia. They just closed down their internal development studio. Jade Raymond is over at what, like Sony now, working <laughs> working on a PlayStation team that she has. I think it's like Haven or something like that she's got. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, it, it's done. It's done. And then. Uh, but br- another brand new place on the thing already has more goodwill than you have with Luna, and and they barely have launched yet. So it, you're done, man. It, it, and I'm not telling them to give up because I think there are people who were bought into that ecosystem that deserve to get their money's worth, absolutely. But uh, it's just it's not impressive. They it's going to take a lot more than these little empty statements. A hundred new games. Name a big one then. Name a massive big day one game that you're getting on stadia that is coming everywhere else is re village mm-hmm. on there is mass effect mm. legendary edition on stadia i don't i don't know i'm just asking you guys like and and somebody in the comment section if you're a stadia fan let me know are, are those on there uh, one major triple a stadia exclusive one anything any may have they tapped into yacht club games to make them a brand new awesome 16-bit game exclusive on stadia have they have they bought games in the way that Game Pass has? They throw some money at people to bring your game here. So if you would like to play it with uh, as low of an entry fee as possible or um, exclusive on here, come to Stadia. Is there a single game that that applies to? Can anybody name something? I, like, it just it seems crazy to me where it's like this is not... And I, I don't mean this in a reductive way, but I was going to say like it's not rocket science in the way that there is precedence on how to operate this. We've seen how to make these things work. If you would like to know how to make a cloud gaming service work, look at the one that's succeeding right now. Project X Cloud is barely out. They tied it to a service that is one of the best subscription services in gaming right now, Game Pass. That's the way to do it. 
Amazon Luna, day one, you subscribe, you have a hundred and something games there to play for you whenever you want. That's it. But to have access to a service that you need to buy the games piecemeal, there's zero reason to do this. And we've broken down Stadia why it doesn't make sense in the past enough, so I won't double down on that. But yeah, this is he's, they're not talking to us. They're talking to investors so they don't yeah. run like there's a freaking plague. Uh, that's all that's happening here. Yeah, absolutely. We, we we and I understood that too. But it's just it's just wild that this is still. I never thought it would die so quickly, but I'm not surprised it did. Um, <laughs> Because I don't want anyone to fail, you know. I, I, you know, I just have some people's jobs around their line. But the fact that again, people were just thrown away quickly, and they luckily landed their feet with other companies and competitors, just shows that this was probably not and, and was not good from the start. Well, yeah, and I, w- I will say this: it's not an uh, an absolute certainty that they will flop because twenty twenty one is a weird year. I mean, didn't GameStop just buy like a massive facility or something? I read about or something like that. So that's true. They bought a, an Amazon-sized warehouse. So they're market. They're on the trajectory to make some kind of weird comeback and moving towards uh, like online fulfillment and stuff like that. So it's a weird world. If GameStop can make it, I guess so could you, Stadia. And I know that's a low bar, but uh, there might be a place for you somewhere. But you got to step up your game. You got to compete, and you got to react and that's the problem is i don't see reaction from stadia being like okay we launched a certain way didn't work out the greatest we our strategy was a little bit off uh let's pivot and try something new i'm not seeing that pivot yet and it's been well over a year and by now personally if i was running things at stadia i'm like okay our strategy we tried our own thing didn't work what are the rest of them doing that is working oh okay so people want a one and done charge and they'll have access to some games uh, okay, let's try it like that and see what that works. And if in the future you would like to offer major, major games day one on your service for an additional fee, so be it. But get people in the door. That's the problem is they're not getting people in the door. There's nobody. They're not talking to anybody when they're like, hey, 100 new games. Who are you talking to? Because it ain't just subscribers because they show those numbers off. If Google mm-hmm. likes to talk about numbers a lot. Show, show off those numbers. They ain't say a dang thing about that. So um, I wish them well. I really do. But I just, it, it's silly to me. Like when they make some of these claims and it's like, where are the exclusives? And I get frustrated with Stadia the exact way I feel like I was getting frustrated with Xbox in like 2013 when mm-hmm. they were with this whole Connect thing and they had all these weird games. It's like, what are you doing? It's the same kind of frustration I have. And luckily, Microsoft and Xbox, they listened. And I think it's about time that Stadia starts run, stops running their mouth and starts opening their ears and start being receptive to the game industry that, you know, is around them. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Completely agree. All right. Well, that was the last story that we have for you guys this week. A longer show. And it seems like mm-hmm. going forward, our shows are probably going to be a lot longer. We're going to move to an every other week model going forward that works a lot better with our schedules since you guys know i relocated across the country but now that i live out here i have access to a lot more retro game stuff so we're probably going to try to find ways to integrate that a little bit more and we can start talking about uh some retro game playing stuff like that too we'll talk off podcast about all that too as well but uh yeah that was episode 52 i'm jabrell and i'm with steve hope you guys enjoyed and we'll see you guys next week